What is up, everybody? Welcome to the Restoration Rundown podcast, the podcast that is dedicated to you, the restoration business owner. My name is Ben Riccardi. I am your host, and I'm the CEO of Ironclad Restoration Marketing, where I help restoration business owners get more sales by getting their internet marketing right. Uh, I want to welcome everybody that's joining us live on LinkedIn and YouTube. Sorry, we had a little technical hiccup here. We're running a little bit late, but that's because I forgot to hit go live, and I've been talking with John our very special guest that we're going to introduce here shortly for about five minutes now before we realize it. Anyhow, if you haven't noticed yet, today we are super excited to have this episode air because we're bringing on not only our very first guest, but he just so happens to be the very best guest we might ever bring on to this show. You may know him as the Intentional Restorer. He's the host of the Diojo podcast and he is an accomplished author and happens to be a restoration contractor. And I'm going to bring him on right now no further ado, I want to welcome Mr. John Isaacson from the Diojo Podcast on to the Restoration Rundown. Look at that beard. Isn't it glorious? John, what's going on, man? Oh, sorry. Just doing a little bit of reading. I had my thinking music on. Um, man, this book here, but I, I, people may think this is a prop, but I, I, I genuinely read the first book that you sent and uh, I really did enjoy it. And while it gives me all the things I need to know to do it myself, it also makes me realize I don't want to do it myself. So great book, The No BS Guide to Internet Marketing for Restoration Contractors, revised edition. Well, that's it for the episode today, guys. Uh, John, <laughs> we our book and we don't need anything else here. No, I'm just kidding. John, listen, man, I want to thank you so much for coming on board. I've been on your podcast at Diojo. Uh, one yes, time, uh, it's been a little bit, but uh, you know we're always going back and forth online. We very we share very similar kind of stories in a sense that we're really here to really help uh, people in this industry and kind of create a better culture of uh, the givers gain mentality, if you will. Um, so I want to welcome you on the podcast. I got to say that beard is awesome, um, and you are you know for everybody out there that doesn't know you, you know if you've been living under a rock, if you're in the restoration industry, you don't know John. Um, John is known as the Intentional Restorer. He's an accomplished author. He's written three books in the space, just had one launch not that long ago. <clears throat> um, he's the host of Diojo Podcast, which is awesome. I always am checking out Diojo to learn a little bit more about the industry. Um, and he's got like the heavy hitters of guests coming on there. Uh, so, John, give me a little background on yourself. Uh, where are you guys based out of and uh, what do you do? Uh, so this hat here is our local baseball team, the Tacoma Rainiers. Um, but, uh, are, are you familiar there on the, on the East coast with Rainier ear vitamin R Ron Yeh? No, no, but you know what? That, that sounds like something I need to get, get really familiar with pretty quickly. We, we should, we should probably be, well, but it's like 10 30 here. You're at one you're a little closer to an appropriate drinking time. Right. But, uh, <laughs> it's Friday. It's it Friday. is Friday. Friday yeah. 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 So really? Um, but I think we were talking a little bit. It's like uh, for 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 people that don't know, it's like uh, Moon Tucky is the logger in Montana. It's the uh, it's the local logger. They got bought out by PBR, so it's not as local anymore. But uh, any of my Pacific Northwest peeps were were representing. So I am in. That's a long way of saying I live in Puyallup, which is right east of Tacoma, which is south of Seattle almost everybody associates Washington with Seattle. And uh, so, yeah, that's, uh, I, I hail from the hallowed halls of Tacoma. Yeah. It's a beautiful area. I like was mentioned before uh, when we we're in the, the green room uh, that I've got family in Southwest <laughs> Montana. So I'm familiar with the, the moon tucky cold snacks and I'm definitely going to yep. have to get familiar with vitamin R pretty soon. I mean, we're down in Florida. We talked a little bit, we've had the, the brewery boom down here the last few years. So, I mean, I literally couldn't walk 20 feet without tripping over a brewery. So you know, yep. and that's the problem of Florida in general. We, we have, it's such a transient state that we don't really have outside of Florida, man. We don't have like anything we can claim as our own as far as beer. Now, I've got a few local favorites that I love uh, out of Palm Beach County. Um, but, you know, as far as having yeah. like that signature like you guys have, or I know I have friends up in uh, Maryland um, that have, oh gosh, I can't remember the name of their beer, but they've got one too that's like, it's like the PBR, but it's like kind of crappy, but it's really good because you want to drink it all the time. Okay, um, okay. You know. Anyway, so the beer would definitely, uh, would maybe next episode we'll do some beer tastings. I'll send you some stuff from Florida. You can send me some of that vitamin R and we'll see what goes with Heck that. Yeah. Yeah. But for now, for the purposes of what we're doing here today, um, you know, I know 
you know, a little bit about your background. Um, but, you know, first, I want to talk about, you know, your start in the restoration industries. You own a restoration company called Eris out there in Washington State. Um, so give me a little bit of a background on, um, you know, how you got into the industry a little bit about the company. Yeah, I'm, I'm my fancy title is VP of Operations, I'm, uh, uh, becoming an owner. So signed on and um, and, and uh, got some ownership options, that kind of thing. But uh, my start. To, let's let's go back to 2002. Um, I had uh, I had a job. I was transitioning to jobs. I had got a, a job closer to home. My wife was pregnant with our first child, her first child. We think it's mine. I think it's yours. I, I mean, I, I mean uh, I'm just gonna go out on a limb. <laughs> um, and 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 so I had a, a a bad job with bad people, and um, and uh, so I was applying to anything and everything. In the newspaper of all places, there was an ad for a local service master for carpet cleaning. Um, do you cover um, newspaper ads here in this uh, this manuscript? No, not yet. I'm I'm waiting for my time machine to get here, and then we're going to go back <laughs> thirty years, and uh, we'll we'll have a chapter on that. It's literally just going to be an ad for my for the book or an attorney, like a uh, an attorney. But it's funny you say that because you know Google works very much like a newspaper ad nowadays, and we'll get to that in a little bit. But uh, back to the newspaper ad for carpet cleaning. Newspaper ads are making a comeback. You heard it here, folks. Um, yeah, so answered an ad uh, for carpet cleaning, and it was like it was one of those just applying to anything and everything. Going to the interview, um, I I thought I was going into criminal justice at the time, and the the owner I interviewed with was like, you know, with your background in science, you'd be real good in this new division we're starting, mold remediation. I said, yeah, I agree, I agree, and uh, so they put me in a suit, go rip out walls. One of my favorite things was like, it was real physical work. There was always something new to do, but like we got in at seven at 10, I would eat my lunch uh, on our 15 minute break. And then we were allowed hour long breaks, hint, hint to some of the owners out there, give your people the opportunity to kind of uh, work with their breaks. And I could study or take a nap, you know, during that hour break. And then my two o'clock break, eat again. And then um, and then once we got off around 3.30 most days, then uh, usually it was like stop by the house for a little bit and then go to school. And uh, it was a real good opportunity. So I thought I was going in another route. Um, and they they kept they offered me management positions. And I, I, I tell people this all the time, like I could write my paperwork so it was legible. And, um, and I really sought to make my manager's job easier, right? They said, I need this friggin' paperwork to be able to bill properly for the job. And I said, okay, that's what you need. Then that's what I'm going to do. And at first I would take it, a chicken scratch in the field and then take it home at night and like rewrite it. And, uh, pretty crazy. What can happen in your career? If you just do your dang paperwork, imagine that. And, uh, and then, if you're career minded, you know, make your boss's job easier. And uh, so so that's kind of so those doors kept opening and the criminal justice stuff wasn't. And so it wasn't I'm not the smartest tool in the shed, but it was like, huh, huh. <laughs> so. But it got you here. Um, so you I mean, so this was this was quite a while ago. So as far as, you know, where you know, fast forward now to where you are, VP of operations, you know, you've got your foot in the, in the door per se for some sort of like ownership in the company. Um, I'm, I'm I have to more. kill the owner. That's, that's okay. I'll, you do. You've got that's the, my own, that's my ownership the, plan. You've got the ultimate warrior in the background. Yep. Somebody already dropped a comment about your half naked man in the room. Uh, nothing suspicious, but listen, you guys don't understand <laughs> that that is a motivation that you walk into every day to end up taking over a company. Like you're not going to go into yeah. a company to take over an ownership from somebody with, uh, you know, some poster with a guy that's fully clothed. I mean, you got to have somebody that's jacked, ripped, ready to go, ready to tear somebody apart. Look at that guy. Speaking of jacked and ripped, I mean, you're a monster. No, I mean, you know, so it's funny that you, you mentioned that twice, so, twice a day. No, I, I do like waking up and going to bed is kind of a workout getting in and out of bed. I usually either rock myself to sleep, <laughs> trying to get up or, uh, or, you know, I'm falling down in the bed, but um, I'll backtrack a little bit. So we, we as a company, honestly, we as a company, we as a company, uh, talking about JC, my partner and myself, um, during the COVID year, we kind of came, we're coming to the office and we kind of realized looking in the mirror, like, man, we put on some weight in the last few years. <laughs> you know, not only with me with getting a dad bod, I've got a, a young child and that kind of, I just kind of gave up on everything at that point. There you go. Um, but 
It's um, hard. We decided as a company, which is really cool and, and really helped with the culture a little bit. Um, we were going to go on like a weight loss competition where it incentivizes. So okay. um, I have a little bit of a background in like exercise and stuff like that. I played sports. I re- used to run yeah. a fitness boot camp, but then I, you know, let go. So I, you know, turned the dad bod. So what we did is in 2020, right in the beginning of the year, we, we set out on this path. We were holding each other accountable. And I think collectively, um, I dropped like 60 something pounds, I think since then, Ooh. um, JC's down like 30, which he really didn't need to lose as much weight as I did. But, uh, you know, collectively it was great. We ended up getting a bunch of people on board, um, which is really cool. So I appreciate the sentiments that I look like a monster. I do have a filter on that makes me look really, really super jacked right now. Nice. And that's why I cut off the bottom half. Not only am I not wearing pants, but, um, you would, you'd be able to see that, that the hangover going on. Yeah. <laughs> too, many, too many Montucky, uh, cold snacks in my life. Yep, yep, um, yep. But um, so ownership wise, so back to, you know, you're on this path to kind of take over. Um, I'm sure and being an operations guy, you've dealt with everything that you could possibly deal with as far as, you know, in the realm of getting sales and leads, like what, what kind of issues did you face or do you guys face as a restoration company before we get into, um, to everything else about your book and everything? So currently, um, yeah, like you said, you know, you said your company is two people, right? My 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 favorite thing on online is what you know. Uh, what is it? Owner, founder, CEO. You know, even mine's ridiculous. VP of operations, and it's like the majority of companies are. You know, you know, that's not to denigrate it in any way, but it's just funny to say, like, yeah, I'm the chief executive officer of what, <laughs> right? You know? And so, you know, but every. Everybody has to start somewhere, and we're a small company. I mean, we're we're a tiny company in in Washington, um, growing, and uh, so we hired our first admin. We've got um, two right run project managers, and we're working hard to try to separate out the the and, and delegate. You know, all the growing pains, right? When you're two guys, mm-hmm. and that's how we started. Me and Chuck, and we did everything, right? Yeah. And then, we make the next hire. And so you start to be able to delegate a little bit and set people maybe a little bit more into their zones. And then, you know, we hired an admin and that's taken a lot of, um, of some of those other pressures, the, the office work off. So um, what currently one of the biggest challenges I think our company is facing is wasting time. Mm. And so um, like we, Thankfully, knock on wood, not trying to toot a horn or anything, we've been able to get a decent amount of leads. And part of that's through program work. Mm. Oh, my gosh. He said it. Uh, We do program work. Uh, So we're one of the villains. We're one of the evil ones. Um, And then we get uh, leads from mitigation contractors because we don't do uh, the MIT. Mm-hmm. And then we're working real hard to, you know, with blogs and a lot of the things you're talking about in the book, right? To, I make some videos to try to, and, and kind of boost those locally um, to try to share for a homeowner or a business owner, this is what your insurance claim should look like from the contractor's perspective, right? Yeah. Uh, Cause it, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> and, um, and so, so with that wasting time, it's like, we, I sit down with our team all the time and it's like, um, if I could spend time on a project that's going to make me money versus chasing something that we know is not, what are some of the things we can do to better screen our clients? Um, and we've started um, doing, your, you'll hear it here first. I haven't really talked to many people about this, a letter of intent where we don't charge them up front. I know a lot of contractors are experimenting and having good um, results with that, but we say, We want you to sign a letter of intent saying that basically the way we explain it, if you decide not to use us, because what's happening a lot is we write a pretty darn good scope and they hire the cheaper guy. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you decide to do that, it's that's completely fine. But um, what what we ask is we're able to recover our time. And so it lists out like our hourly rate and the minimum. And there's actually been some insurance companies that even pay that. We put that in the estimate and they pay that. Not all of them and definitely not in program work. Right. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) But, um, you know, so it's so funny because everybody's like, you know, silver bullet, this silver bullet, that there's no friggin' silver bullets. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, try it, make sure it's legal, you know, discuss it amongst yourselves, make sure it's ethical and then test it out. Right. You, you know, the first time explaining it to a customer, it's like, um, you know, we have this letter of intent. And, uh, 
And the first customer I talked to about it, they were like, that makes sense. Like, oh yeah, 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 it does. Yes. Yeah, you, get a little base, you get a little more bass in your voice after that, the next couple of phone calls. So yeah. yeah, I mean, it's being consistent with that too. And you know, and you're not going to, and it's like anything in life, you know, just you nailed it. It's, try it, do it, make sure it works within the parameters and the scope of what you're trying to accomplish, but more so be consistent and not have that shiny new object syndrome where you're bouncing all over the place. Yeah. Um, you know, pick a path, get on it, make sure it works, trial and error. Um, Cause that's really the only way to, to really shake out to see if something's going to work. Um, well, so all the crap we do though, is that right? Even internet marketing, right? If you're just like, I want more leads. Well, that's not specific enough. Like right. what kind of leads do you want? Where do you want them from? Yes. You know? So ours was when we really sat down, it's like, it, we're wasting a lot of time on stuff mm -hmm. that's not paying the bills. So how so you do we. That you're intentional now with what you're trying to do. <sighs> <laughs> I, you know, <laughs> I mean, are you being intentional? So, and, uh, and that's, and where wait, I want to get to is like, so you host this podcast about that, right? I mean, you, you are writing books about this stuff. How did you go from, and I, and I get, and I'm just going out on a limb here. You started, you didn't just start writing books. You didn't start doing any of that. I what, lost all my hair. You know what? It's funny that you said that about running a business and having a small business and how many different hats that you have to wear. <laughs> so now you have your third hat of the 15 minutes into the interview. <laughs> um, so, so walk me through a little bit how Diojo came about and give us a little background on what it is. If there's anybody out there that's going to be listening to this, we're streaming, um, or watching live, um, that might not know about you. What, like, how did that come about from your path to, uh, vice president of operations? So I, I, I like the story podcasting. I was working for an abatement company, right? And we were talking, we were brainstorming ideas to get in front of contractors that would refer us or use us for abatement, right? So if I cold call a contractor like, hey, ex contractor, can I come talk to you? Can I bring coffee for your team? Blah, 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 right? No, you know, we're too busy, right? Everybody's friggin' busy. And, um, and this was COVID too. So <clears throat> even harder to get in person meetings and, mm -hmm. and, and get the word out there. So I'm sitting in the meeting, and I said, why I had been debating the idea. Um, Michelle Blevins and my good friend, Greg Power. I like to write. That's my cover comfort zone. And so if I could do that, uh, and they both encourage at separate times, like just make a little video that goes along with your article. It'll accelerate the content that you're trying to get out. Right. So, okay. So then there's these podcasts. I love podcasts. I listen to podcasts almost more than I listen to music, just depending on the day. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I came to the company and I said, let's do a podcast. And they're like, oh, what's it now? You know. <laughs> and so I said, this podcast literally does not have to have any listeners to be successful. Because if I go to X contractor, I say, hey, would you like to talk about yourself? And they're like, yeah, yeah, I'd like to talk about myself. A little secret, everybody likes to talk about themselves, right? Oh, I don't, I don't, bullshit. So, um, you know, you, 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 that's what I said. I was like, we'll go to this, you know, we had a list of contractors we're trying to get with. I was like, I bet you I could get 60% of them to go on a podcast. I'm like, well, you know, what would this take? And I was like, it wouldn't take anything. Like, you know, we just need, you know, I maybe need a hundred dollar microphone and a, and a video camera and just dedicate the time. And they said, well, why don't you do a test run or something like that? And I was so pissed. I was like, no, I'm not going to do a test run. You guys are either in or you're out. Like, I'm not going to waste time doing right. Like, well, let's think about it. And we had an ops guy at the time. And so, um, anyways, so I said, you know what? I'm gonna prove it works. And so that's how the Dojo podcast got started. <laughs> but that uh, encouragement to anybody out there, I think your book touches on this too, is like just start doing something, right? Like yeah. start. You're gonna we'll quote on the cover. What's I mean, that? Quote on the cover. The start is what stops most people. Don Shula, I right? Don. Yeah, uh, no, it, it's true. Just start somewhere and you'll, as you continue to do it, you'll get better at it, right? You're going to get your teeth kicked in. People are going to hate it. But, yeah. you know, if, if you know what your goal is, right? Like in that particular instance, the goal was to to get in, in touch with other contractors. Like <laughs> Nobody has to watch it for it to be successful. It just depends on what, like if you're trying to grow the biggest podcast ever, then yeah, you're going to have to play that game. But um you got to have me as a guest. I mean, obviously. There you go. Agree. So, so I know you started. So it sounds like you know. So you started. Um, I, I guess we'll call it as a foot in the door to get in with you know guys in the industry. Say, hey, you want to come on a podcast? And it's a way to get to know people, and that's awesome because that's 
one touch point. And, you know, obviously this has evolved into something much bigger than that. So yeah. what, what can you talk about how that works and, you know, kind of what the goals are now? I mean, I'm sure the goals have shifted somewhat now with, yeah. uh, with your podcast and did the books come after you started the other, did you already write those be before? Um, shoot. Do I have the book up here? So, okay. The, the podcast, the other thing that happened with the podcast was, um, COVID hit, right. And all this cleaning stuff. And I was watching a video of someone promoting their cleaning and they're just wiping the walls like this. And anybody that's done mold or any level of effective cleaning, we used to always teach our teams for mold. Imagine there's chicken blood, you yeah. know, you got raw chicken all over the counter. If I just go like this, I've now taken a small problem and I've made it that much worse. So you've got to have a specific never double dip. You know, you always got a clean rag, you fold the surfaces, you wipe, wipe, wipe. So the first couple, four or five, I think are, it was called three questions with the pro. It wasn't even the Diojo podcast, but it was videos reaching out to people um, trying to get like alternative sources. We have this hive mindset that somehow only restoration people know what's going on in restoration and like, <laughs> you know, and th there's, there's a lot of noise and a lot of just bad crappy advice mm -hmm. out there. And so I think it's important. Know what, you know, um, you know, one of my favorite podcasts in the space is uh, Jarrett steers GMS podcast. Cause he just asks questions. He's not a restorer. You know, he makes an awesome, um, the GMS distribution box and he just asks good questions. You know, um, I've enjoyed watching yours. You know, you're, you come from the value standpoint, right? It's not like, Hey, sign up with ironclad. It's like, Hey, think about this. This is what SEO is. This is what this is. This is what this is. Do this simple tweak. Boom. You know, it's gonna, it's yeah. not going to overnight increase your SEO, but it'll creep it towards the goal. Right. So that was the other motivator for the podcast. And then I read another great book from Rachel Stewart, Unqualified Success, Bridging the Gap Between Where You Are Now and Where You Want to Be. I was on an airplane. I don't remember where, but it clicked that um, the Diojo was kind of the thing. I think I had a brand that people could identify with. And um, my article, I, I believe it was 2018. It was at R and R when Michelle was at, Blevins was at R and R. It was the Ten Commandments of Exactimate Estimating Success, and it was the most popular article of 2018. And so it wasn't like I read that she sends a list out that says, you know, this is um, that, and I was like, it wasn't like, oh, cruel, I got the best article. I was like, oh, people are interested. It was helpful. I was mm -hmm. open. That's what that indicated. It was helpful, right? So then basically took, I had the meat there and just repurposed that from an article, expanded on some of those things and, and turned that into a book. So turn that into now uh, that was the be intentional estimating the, book. Yeah. The first, the first, the be intentional estimating. And you've, and you've since then published uh, two other books. Um, you've got the, the be intentional culture, which is, is huge. And I'm definitely, it's on my list of things to read. I have a stack about this high, Yep. Um, of books yep. and yep. that's in there. Um, and, and not only because of, you know, knowing you and, and following you for a while, but I believe culture is a huge part of any company. You know, we are yep. a digital marketing agency. We specialize in, in helping restoration contractors. And, you know, it's very important to me to have a culture that is, you know, you, you mentioned, you know, taking those hour breaks and understanding and, 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 and empowering your employees to do certain yep. things. Um, because, you know, if you, are the smartest guy in the room, you're in the wrong room, right? So creating unless, a culture, unless yeah. you're in a room full of fifth graders. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, unless you're a fifth grade teacher, so I'll keep throwing. <laughs> um, so no, I mean, and, and so that's killer. I mean, you said writing is, a, you know, something that you're really into. I, I share that same sentiment. I feel like, you know, writing is a big strong point of mine. Um, and we started doing this. So can you talk about a little bit about, you know, how, why did you, uh, you know, why did you write these books in the first place? I mean, is that really just like, Hey, I wanted to just help and make millions of dollars and just get as many fat heads of ultimate warrior and WWF guys as possible. Or what, what was the motivation behind, you know, the, the series? And again, the series is called the be intentional series. I mean, are those ones, bro? Do you see this? Do is you those, see this? Those, is, that, is that ones? Oh, damn. It's literally all ones. I think my wife got into my wallet. These are all ones. That wasn't intentional, but, uh, <laughs> 
Yeah, I thought there was going to be a twenty in there or something. Yikes! If there's anybody in um in a, a country that the dollar is is strong in is probably looking at this like, damn, this guy's got Ooh. it going on. I need to get out to Washington State. Um, I need to write me some books. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so you, you've got these three books under your belt, and as as somebody that's written a book or two, no, I guess one and a half books. You know, we have the revised edition, which is like ninety extra pages. Um, that's a lot of work, man. Like, so how did you? How did you do? How did you do it? Like, and you're hosting this. I mean, you're po you guys air an episode once a week, like minimum. Yeah. Or are you doing more than that? So, how did well, you? The I first set out. You'll laugh at this. I wanted to do two a week. Okay. When I first set out, so and then there are interviews. Did some editing. My goal always, like I call it infotainment. So, mm -hmm. um, the strength, your greatest strength is also your greatest weakness. So the strength is I create the podcast that I think I would want to listen to. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, what that tells me is there's not a lot of people that want to listen to the things that I want to listen to. <laughs> so we've got, you know, 14 listeners, 14 faithful listeners, um, you know, we had at the beginning of the year 12, one of them died, and then we, we added hmm. uh, three. And so, um, you know, but yeah, it's it's a ton of work. So I went from trying to do two a week to like, oh my gosh, this is too much work. And then I went to live. The The beauty of live is there's no editing. Yeah. The downfall of live is there's no editing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, you know, you get a dud or somebody, you know, doesn't... Um, you know, bring their a game, then, you know, you, you, you're where you're at. Yeah. And, uh, like this, right. I mean, you're probably thinking like, yeah, yeah. Geez, John, thanks for bringing it. Um, <laughs> and so, so with the books, I actually, I had this harebrained scheme that if I got other people to write with me, everybody would share in the cross promotion and those kinds of things. Um, and so the culture book was intended to be first for that purpose, a little bit selfishly, like let's, cut the workout or, 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 or distribute the, the load sure. cross promote and it would generate some buzz. Um, it was more work, you know, cause you're editing, not everybody meets the deadlines and that's not uh, any fault. I mean, just people are friggin' busy, you know? Yeah, yeah. So it's very difficult to get everybody coordinated. Um, and then people would drop out for various personal reasons, professional reasons, you know, those kinds of things. And so, uh, and I, I and we had a publisher lined up and they had to bow out as well. And, and somebody that was experienced in that process. So then I didn't feel like it was fair to experiment on the first book that could potentially impact other people. Yeah. So I moved the estimating book up and, and it's like, this will be my <laughs> experimental baby. And, um, so, so that's why it came out first. And so, um, you know, the, the culture book was a lot of fun just because uh, the idea there was get leaders in companies to share about things that have worked for them and not worked for them. That, you know, really the principle was what's one thing that's really helped you, one small thing that's helped you that you do consistently, and what's one experience or thing that you've done that you're like, oh, crap. You know, I say this, but I'm doing this, and it really impacted where I'm trying to go. So it, it's designed to be, you know, one of those, you know, kind of a practical, you know, book. So, and I can't yeah. say enough. I, I love the be intentional, you know, mantra. I mean, that like your nickname that, and that's what we preach here with, with whether it's our clients or my value that I'm just putting out here. Hopefully there's some value. And you, it's funny, you had the, that stack of ones. That's like how I look at how many people listen to my podcast. Like I, I'm like, <laughs> on a good day. We've got literally ones of people watching or listening in, uh, but that's not the point. You know, the point is, uh, for that person that might be struggling, that's been in, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've owned multiple businesses and it sounds like you've done a lot and you've been through this journey to get where you're at now. So if these things could even just offer that one person, just that little thing that they could do to push themselves to that next level, or at least reaffirm that they're on the right track. Um, I think that's a great goal to have at the end of the day. So is there any kind of way people should be reading your books? Like a, a like an order is there, or just whatever they're trying um, So I think uh, the culture book kind of is a standalone, you know, that's um, I guess that there's a thread. So I try to write in principle to people like myself, like I wasn't the sharpest tool in the shed um, or the most talented, but like if you're, if you're hardworking uh, and you're honest and you're willing to learn, like you can learn 
anything and everything in this mm -hmm. industry, right? And mm -hmm. I, I believe you would say it's the same with, with what you do with SEO, right? Like it's not you're a brainiac, right? That, you know, God just like showed you the, the golden key, right? It's, it's a lot of friggin' hard work, trial and error and trying to, okay, I think this person can help me understand this a little bit better. So the books are all written to people like myself, like you want to grow your career. Okay. Here's, and they're all kind of more mindset and habits. They're not, my books yeah. are not at this point, like technical manuals that are going to take you step by step through the process. But and honestly, it's more um, changing your mindset. Like if you want to get from A to B, what got you to A, you're going to have to keep those core principles intact, those core values. But you got to change your mindset and you got to change your perspective if you want a different result. You know, so yeah, uh, that paperwork type of thing, that's a consistent, right? You're, as you move up the ladder, as you get into leadership roles, it's more paperwork, not less. So if you're a technician and you want to promote, do your damn paperwork, you know, like it's, it's, you're not going to have less paperwork as you promote. It's not like you're going to yeah. get out of doing those things that are tedious. Um, and a lot of the other stuff I see all the time. Uh, and even in my own experience, people get put into management roles. You have some kind of proficiency. Maybe you're doing your paperwork better. Maybe you're faster than this guy or this. And so you get put in a leadership role, you know, or a management role. And there's, there's, no training and helping. And I, I don't mean that as a, a dig at owners and other managers. There's just not a lot of time, right? So right. it's like, you know, most of us were thrown into roles and had to figure it out. And and so, and we swear to ourselves, you know, when I get into a role, I'm going to do it different. And then you get into the role and you're like, oh crap. You know, if you're honest with yourself, you're doing a lot of the same things. Maybe yeah. you're doing a little bit better, right? Like being a new parent, right? You know, like, if your only goal is to be a little bit better than your parents, then, you know, that's not a great vision. You know, it's like, okay, what are kind of my core principles? What do I want to see happen in my family? You know, same thing at work. Right. What, what, what's important to us? What's going to be different about us? And then, and then be realistic. Like if you're trying to tackle 12 things at once, mm -hmm. like you're just going to burn yourself out. So right. just take that one thing. And if it takes you three months to get that down, so be it. You got it down, right? Like it's the same thing as you're going through the, like the project management book. If you're, if you're working on a job, right, try to do everything you can in that file at that time until you get to a point where you can no longer do something else. And sometimes that means like, I'm sorry, I'm not going to be answering phone calls for an hour because I need to get this done. And then, you know, you look at your phone and, you know, you try to think like, is that an emergency or not an emergency, you know, but if you if you can knock things off the list rather than keep carrying the list over, you'll you'll actually get something done. You know, so a lot of that is just simplifying. So long answer. I think the thread in the books, my target would be people that want to uh, move up in their career, people that, uh, you know, are in new to management and then owners trying to, you know, I, I would hope an owner would read it and say, yeah, these are a lot of things I'm saying and I'd like you know, it just comes from another voice, right? It just hits. Right. A right. right? It's, it's a reaffirmation. Yeah. It's yeah. not being magical. It's just, yeah, yeah. Okay. This guy said it. It's, and you, know? you hit the nail on the head, man. I mean, with anything in life, right? It's yeah. your brain. You got to look at your brain like a garden and, and no matter what seed you plant in it, your brain is abundant in, yeah. in, in, in it's abundance of, of pushing whatever that seed is that you plant. And so, you know, when you're planting knowledge and you're planting these positive thinkings and you have a goal in mind. So if you're, you are a, a guy that's just starting out a laborer. And I've, I've been in the site development industry. Like I laid, you know, family, you know, tr yep. uh, trade as we were pipe layers. So I've been there. I worked manual labor since the time I was 12 up until, you know, we, you know, I started diving in and teaching myself digital marketing um, about eight or nine years ago. And then, you know, created this company, but you have a goal in mind. Um, sometimes that goal, you can get there quick. If you're just super hyper-focused, which I'm not, yeah. I'm, I'm kind of all over the place. Yeah. Um, but you, you end up getting there as long as you're clear and you're intentional in your steps that you make, um, whether it takes you a month or seven years to get there, if you yeah. stay on that path, you're going to get there. So your books are an awesome uh, way for guys. If you're listening out there and you're looking for a way to move up in your company, um, you got to check out the series of three books. You can go to dojo.com. What's the easiest way for them to buy the book? Um, probably on Amazon is the easiest. Okay. Like if you want to order in bulk, I can do some discounts and some people want signed copies. 
I'll be at RIA uh, in April, RIA mm -hmm. in Reno. And um, so I'll have some books with me if people want signed copies or bring it or whatever. I won't be in Reno. Unfortunately, we're going to be at the next one, but I definitely want to get a signed copy one of these days of the book. Yep. Um, so I want to go to switch gears a little bit, right? So I want to give a little bit more value. So we talked about your book. We talked about, you know, your path to getting here in the restoration industry. So I want to talk a little bit to these guys, to guys out there that might be an entrepreneur um, that might want to be getting started in the industry. Maybe they work for somebody else, you know, kind yeah. of how you did and they're ready to go. Um, you know, if you had to do it all over again, you had to start a restoration company, what, what would you do knowing you know now, what would you do different? And, you know, kind of what would be like the foundation that you set right off the bat? Honestly, if, if, if I, I have this conversation frequently, if I were going to start over again, I would only chase fires <gasps> because, um, the magnitude, um, of, you know, you just need a handful of those to reach, say that million dollar mark, right. Right. And then you could subcontract everything or perform what you want to perform. I think right now, if, you, if you're thinking of going into business, try to target the things that you can do with the least amount of resources immediately. Um, so I did, I, I, in full transparency, I started my own business right before the great recession, you know, a great time to start a business. And that's um, when I bought my first house, by the way, <laughs> <laughs> Yep, <laughs> uh, did not survive, you know, but like we, for those that were in business at the time, you can remember like November phones ringing off the hook, contract signed February yep. dead, like, yep. like dead, dead. Um, and, and, uh, it impacted the, the construction industry huge. Yep. And so, um, you know, a lot, I personally, my, I'm conservative to a fault. So if someone were asking me like you have, I would find what is the, the lowest barrier to entry possible that I can start generating a paycheck immediately with. That's what I would, I would go after. And so, um, you know, people talk about, if you're going to jump ship, make sure there's a boat close to the dock, you know, uh -huh. so you got to start doing some of those things. Maybe that means you work nights and weekends. Yeah. Um, and, and I know you got to be careful. I think you got to do business the right way, not burn bridges. Um, you know, that said, plenty of companies would throw you out with the bathwater tomorrow, you know, so like you got to be a little careful. I don't think you should steal clients, but, um, you know, if there's clients that are faithful to you and they call you, you know, that's not necessarily sure. your fault. So I think your reputation is important. But, um, you know, I think most of that, if you're going to you can't go from a technician to just having the business, you got to start doing something, getting a footprint out there. So use where you're at to start building your presence and, and maybe the right business for you to start isn't in restoration, you know, so. Right. Like start going to some of the friggin' chamber events, start um, networking with other contractors. You know, the way I was able to start my business, we had um, an industrial hygienist. And when I, I, I left on good terms with the company I was at to start my business and he actually helped me, let me borrow equipment or rent equipment and stuff like that. And, um, and so I took the hygienist with me. And he didn't have resources to do the mold work. But when he got mold work, then I was a sub for him. So like I maybe a little bit on the rare side, when we've had drywall people or contractors or even mitt people, I always told my people, if you're thinking about making a change, please let me know because I want to be the first one to help you. And especially our carpenters, if you're ever thinking of starting your own business, I want you to be my sub, you know, yeah, like right. I want to be your first customer, you know? So I, I, you know, I think as an owner, I don't think that should be like a, Oh my God, my people are leaving. Well, like that's a you problem, you know, right. like, right. It's very natural for somebody that's skilled to want to start their own business. So why don't you be the first investor in their business and, and then, okay, you're not my carpenter anymore, but you can be my sub, you know, like, or, so it's a little harder maybe with MIT, um, you know, and those kinds of things. But even there, I mean, how many times do you need extra help with demo or you got that fire clean out and wouldn't it be awesome. The guy you trained or the gal that you trained is now your sub for fire jobs. Like, yep. why not? 
you know, so you should be, you know, the owners out there. And I know we were initially talking about people starting, but for owners out there, they're thinking about it. We go back to that culture word. Yeah. Um, learn how to be a little bit more proactive and identify these people that are in your company because you talk about a way to scale your business. Yeah. You need to get the jobs and you need to get leads, but what better way than having a group? And, and I know having a construction background that you're only as good as your subcontractors are going to be. Um, especially when you're talking about quality of work and, and getting things done on time and paperwork for your, you know, for, for what you're doing, making sure things are legit. Yeah. So owners out there, listen, be proactive. If you, I have those employees that are just bang up, you know, be the first person to step in and ask them. And we do the same thing yeah. here um, with our, with our marketing clients. You know, when we find that thing um, that's out there, you know, we have guys that we've had people ask us about TikTok and things like that. And we, you know, we don't want to leave it to them to ask us, you know, we want, yeah. we are here to partner with you to grow your business and we're going to be proactive. We're going to address that first. And does that work for, no, I mean, I would say if you want to learn how to dance or whatever the case may be, you know, go ahead and do that. So um, no, that was really great. Um, you know, might not be what, you know, the out the box, you know, answer everybody probably be expecting, but it's real. Um, yeah. You know, and culture is a big part of it now building. Um, so getting leads, let's go back to that a little bit. Um, you know, guys that are just starting out guys that are maybe in the industry. I, there's a lot of guys out there that never hit that half a million mark. They've been in the business for five yeah. or six years that are struggling constantly. So I know you guys do program work, but what, you know, a lot of people like to build relationships. And you mentioned that in the very beginning, how you were, you know, either cold calling guys, you know, whether you're calling like an indoor air quality company and saying, Hey, we want to be your uh, mediator or you're an indoor yeah. air quality guy. And you're trying to get some mold testing jobs. Um, what, what's the best way in your opinion or in your experience to build these relationships with insurance companies, public adjusters, plumbers, roofers, who, who are going to be in those verticals that are going to be to funnel these leads in that referral kind of stuff? Yeah, I, I mean, um, I'll, I'll share two. Somebody on the socials was talking about, I'm going to go do my first cold calls with agents. Um, you know, so what should I do? And all these people are like, da, 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 da. And I think the first thing you ask is like, you know, how's your family? You know, like, like build a relate, be a friggin' sure. person. You first. hit the nail on the head. Relationship. Right. Yeah. Right. Yep. Yeah. So you know, hey, I'm better than Sir Pro. So you you go ahead and use me. Here's my card. See you later. Right. It's so funny. My my good friend Greg, um, who works for us, um, he got he got his appointment. I think it was an AmFam agent, right? And so we go in, we sit down. And he's just going into it. He's like, you know, he's so excited about what he does and what he's been learning. He's like, and, and the meeting, right? This is his first possible referral client. He's like, you know, we come in, we do four foot flood cards, and we put the plastic up, and then the machines come in, and then we can put the drywall in, and da 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 da. <gasps> we're going to Washington, D.C. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so there's a pause, and I'm just kind of looking around, and I was like, oh, your son plays baseball, huh? And, you know, and then so we start this conversation. So then in the car afterwards, when we still laugh about it, four foot flood cuts, you know, four foot flood cuts. <laughs> and, um, and, and, and it's just like, you know, like just like they know the drill, right? An agent yeah. probably knows the drill, probably already has a contractor. I can tell you the best agent I've ever had when I first met with him had a contractor that he loved. Yeah. So a lot of, I see a lot of contractors saying like, well, those guys are terrible. You idiot. Like that's getting you nowhere. That's probably mm -hmm. getting you. You're not even on the list at that point. Just say, oh, I've heard great things about them. That's a great competitor. You know, what I would like is if they're ever busy or yeah. they can't get to a call, give me your crappiest job. That's normally what I say. Give us your crappiest job. And I tell my team, if these people call, we got to be on it. Cause they're not going to give you like a no. $300,000 fire out of the gate, right? Like you're going to get a real crappy job. Yep. So, and you and better not out of the water. Huh? Right. You need to just get one opportunity to make that first impression outside of, you know, the introduction that you're making. So yeah. Yep. And it's, and, and, but don't be abused to where every lead they give you is the crappy yeah. lead. You know, I usually say three, you know, I say the same thing with subcontractors when I'm onboarding them, give us three jobs and we'll show you you know, how the process works and whether this is going to fit for you. Same thing with the agents, you know, they're going to give us our property managers. Let's get three jobs with this potential referral source. If we get to that point and, and see how it goes, if it's clear, they're just giving us the stuff that their other guy doesn't want, then that's not the agent for us. But, but it's harder even now. I mean, there's a lot of power being taken away from the agent. There's power being taken away from the adjusters. You know, people are frustrated so I think, I think you always, whoever you're going after, the number one thing you got to think about is not whatever your friggin' pitch is, is what is their pain point? Yes. You know, and, and what can you potentially, and again, people are like, well, their pain point is water damage. No, it's not. 
-hmm. What does an agent want? They want to keep their client, right? Mm -hmm. Like they're in competition with all the other friggin' agents. They're in competition with Geico or all states in competition with Encompass, which yep. is the online version of their product, you know, that's, that's yeah. still in their clients. Right. So, you know, if a person's going to have an agent, there's only one reason that service, and you've got to be an extension of that, right. Property managers, <laughs> you know, realtors, they want it cheap, you know, and that's, yeah. not, that's not a game you want to play. So you got to find the few needles in the haystack that, um, want service, you know? So what would you say, um, you know, out of all of them, you know, public adjusters, insurance companies, project, uh, property managers, what, what, sh which one, if you had to choose one out of them to focus on, if you're just getting started or you really wanted to go, is there any that you think that are, are better options? I mean, I know this world is built on relationships. So at the end of the day, um, you know, being tactful, setting expectations up front and building those relationships. But if you did have to pick one, um, can you pick one or am I just, I mean, is it, I, 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 I I, I guess I would turn it back to you. I think when you're first starting, you you cast mm -hmm. as wide of a net as possible. Mm -hmm. And one of the number one questions you're asking, you better be creating a spread, spreadsheet, right? This is their yes. name, their 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 address, their emails. Get them on an email list um, and, and try to hit them once a month. Don't flood them with information, but try to be consistent. Yeah. And, and what you're doing those first couple of meetings is eliminating the ones that you don't want to go back to, right? Those people were jerks, you know, yeah, they have yeah. no clue, you know, ask them a good question to ask is, Hey, do people call into your, if it's a, an agent, do people call into your office and do you, are you hands-on as when it comes to the claims process? They're like, Oh, we always refer them to 1-800 number. Well, <laughs> probably not going to get a lead from them, yeah, right? Exactly. They don't, they don't <clears throat> encourage their people to call in. Um, so when I was in California, property managers were huge. We we had a two or three great property managers. Um, when I was in Oregon, it was uh, a hygienist, right? That I mean, yeah. like fifty percent of my work was from a hygienist. Um, and then uh, when I was in Eugene, it was a little bit of everything. I had schools, you know, a, a couple of people at like the University of Oregon was a big account for me, um, and. Uh, and uh hospitals i started in eugene i started a, a networking group for facilities managers and that um you know uh, that got us some a good amount of work um and then up here it's been mitigation contractors um and uh where else mostly mitigation contractors currently is is where but again we're focusing on the repair side so i think it depends I think if you're starting, you just, you go to everything, every BNI group, every whatever networking group, yeah. usually you can go three times without paying, right? Go to all yeah. of them. Rotary Club. You just change your business name and go again three more times. I, I was a member <laughs> of BNI. I learned, I learned and we, we did well. And, you know, being an entrepreneur, I kind of like bucket everything into the same bucket, right? You're, you're starting a business. You need to grow that business. And so, yeah, you should be casting that really wide net. And yeah, and you should be touching base with each one of those people. I want to go back real quick with the Diojo podcast. Um, you've had dude, everybody on there that you can think of. I, I mean, that I could, I could imagine who's been your favorite guest so far. Um, is that going to make anybody mad? I don't um, care if it does. No, nobody listens. Right. Okay. Um, good, good, good. It's just between you and I and the other two people that are watching right now. And probably one of them is JC. <laughs> well, dude, Ed Cross, if, if you don't know Ed Cross, uh, restoration lawyer, uh, you'll always learn something when he's on, my first guest was David Princeton. He's now writing for um, CNR Magazine. He helps people when their claims are doubtful and disputed. I think it's very important to learn from people that are industry adjacent or outside of the industry. Yes. On a personal level, John Downey was really, uh, he was the original founder of Clean Facts Magazine. He was very personal in his story. And I thought that was, I mean, there was a level of transparency there that, um, and especially his interview on IEQ Radio. Um and then I personally have a, 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 an interest in history. The the so like I've got to interview uh, Claude Blackburn, the founder of Dry Ease. Um, Lloyd Weaver has passed away. He invented the Porta Dryer, but his sons. That's an upcoming episode. Cliff Zotnick, the Z-Man, um, uh, and Pete Consigli, the global restoration watchdog. So um, anytime. Anytime that our conversation unearths some aspect of restoration history, you know, those are ones that I zero in on. And um, yeah, I, I, we've been very fortunate that, um, you know, everybody that we've had on, I feel has brought some kind of value. 
and the and the uh, you know the nice thing about editing the show is you get to cut out you know stuff that you're like Meh. <laughs> yeah so yeah the, and by the way your edits are f- so funny i mean that's one of my favorite part your little bites that you put out there when you're advertising yeah. you're like man i i do love them we we definitely are kindred spirits in our personalities as far as what we think is funny and maybe some people might not but i you know i really don't care i'm not doing this for uh you know for anybody but myself and the people that are going to find the value in it yep um, and so speaking of finding value so outside of being a a best selling author right i mean i can say that you are and you are a contractor and you are also the host of a podcast diojo is also you, you also help guys you also have like a business coaching um kind of thing can you talk a little bit about that and how people can get in touch with you if they do need some help and they yeah, don't agree, I, like me I, I i'm super fortunate you know i have a good job and so i don't need anything that i'm doing to pay the bills mm-hmm. um so i think the same thing goes in your business uh and then coaching and those kinds of things is like the price is the price right so yeah. so um you know i just had a conversation with somebody today and they didn't like the price and it was like well you know literally you don't understand how much of an inconvenience it is to everything else i'm doing to do it and i don't mean that to be boastful i just know the value of my time and what i want to be involved in and so you know i wish you well i refer more people to other people than i take on in that in that aspect just because um, and, and, and honestly, uh, like you said, like, um, for the podcast, it, when people, one guy said annoying, but helpful, um, somebody else said, you know, the edits are cringe or, you know, there's just too much going on. And that just encourages me in yeah. the book. I'll, I'll, t- I'll tell you a fun story and maybe a little bit how I'm wired. Chapter two has, uh, it's a quote from Pewee Herman. And then I drew, the the scene in uh, Pee Wee's Big Adventure, one of my favorite movies. Oh my gosh! Out and um and uh, David Princeton, I'm calling him out. He was like, "Dude, you need to not um not you know that's you're you're getting on iffy territory." And I was like, "David, you saying that makes me want to double down." Yeah. And so I made it even more prominent in the chapter. And so, and, and I've gotten some feedback from people like, I just couldn't read the chapter. And I was like, perfect. Oh, you man. know, <laughs> that opening scene of Pee Wee, you know, the big adventure. I mean, dude, that got yeah. me hooked on Mr. T cereal. My, <laughs> when that yeah, went away, yeah, that was like yeah. a big moment in my life when you could no longer find that. Or, you know, my parents did have the money to afford like cereal that wasn't just a big chunk of wheat that just came yeah, out of the box. Yeah. Um, yeah, 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 no, that's awesome. I can't wait to check that out. Um, so you're helping people, you know, with your podcast, you're helping them with business coaching, you know. Look, if you're a guy out there or a, a lady out there and you're a restorer and you're struggling in any aspect of your business, um, you got to check them out. Um, and, and listen, if you're putting a price on knowledge and your and your and your success in your business, then, you know, obviously they're not a good candidate for what you do, um, because really the information and your years of experience and all the the uh, missteps you've probably taken in your life, like most entrepreneurs yes. or anybody that's yeah. in the industry, all the failures. Yep. It, it's and, and that's value. I mean, you can't put a price tag on that. You know, yep. you, you, when people ask like, what's the price? Oh, I think that's too high. And like, well, what are you basing that number on? Um, you know, my 25 years in doing this and like, I've made all the same mistakes and I've been in the BNI groups. So I'm calling everybody in the sun and I'm not getting anywhere. Yep. And you know, we deal with it too. You know, guys will call us say, Oh, we bounce around from company to company. We tried throwing money at pay-per-click and then we've done this website and done this landing page and we're tried this yep. and that. And I, and then we say, well, this is what you need to do to get leads. I mean, it's, it's, you can look it up anywhere. There's a book, yeah. there's plenty of books. I mean, it's, it's cut and dry. So that's too expensive. And it's like, well, you know, you've, you've spent $250,000 in the last two yeah. years on yep. digital Something marketing works. agencies, banking on ambiguity of their services and kind of just knowing that you don't know anything about it and just saying, oh yeah, 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 it's working. You got to spend more money. And now you're coming to me saying, please, we need help. And then when we say, Hey, it's going to cost some money. Like, whoa, 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 whoa. You yeah. know, wait a minute. Yeah. So, you know, and I don't, and, I, and I'm good with that. I understand that mentality. And that's one of the other reasons I wrote the book. Well, it's okay. Great. You don't want to pay somebody to do it here. Yeah. Here you go. Here's the blueprint. I mean, everything is in there. Um, I know I say it all the time and it's really refreshing to hear that you've looked through it. Um, and you know, again, the landscape of digital marketing changes on a weekly basis. So, I mean, yeah. I, like I told you before, we're already working on the next revised, revised edition three of this. Um, but you know, what people need to understand is guys like you that are out there, um, that, that place 
uh, I guess, value, education over profit, um, yeah. are you're going to end up winning. You're going to end up getting there a little further and people will catch on eventually, uh, whether it's for the entertainment value of what you bring to the table with your podcast or the actual tangible value you bring with your, um, your coaching um, yeah. and then the value your company is going to be bringing to your area in Washington State. Um, I think it's really cool and it's been really fun getting to know you. Um, you've Man, you, you've shared your background with us, how you got in the industry. You've given some really good, solid advice to guys out there that might be thinking about taking that next step, whether it's within their own company or starting off on their own. Um, you guys got to check out his books. You can find them on Amazon, the Be Intentional series. Um, I know that they're really good. I've seen, you know, they're bestsellers, right? I mean, I've seen the, I've seen the post. Moderately no, no, so. I can't edit this. Remember, I can't edit it. They are bestsellers. <laughs> New York Times has listed them as three must-read books. If you are in a restoration space, John, um, I can't thank you enough. When uh, when can people tune into your podcast? Uh, mo most of the time on Thursdays. So I, I've scaled back to closer to every other week. Um, and it just depends. But like you said, almost always posting content and, and yeah. messing around with different platforms. Can I just say for, no. for people coming no. to you and, and, and interested in coaching, I, I, the worst thing you can do, I think, if you're going to get a coach or if you're going to reach out to somebody is be ambiguous about what the heck you want to solve. So before you reach out to somebody else, if you're reaching out to somebody else to tell you what your problem is and how to solve it, you're just setting yourself up to be used and abused, right? So yeah. if yeah. someone's coming to you looking for internet, what do you want from the internet? And right, if you're right, coming right. to somebody as a coach, what do you, what problem do you want to solve? Yep. And I think, I think you would agree. Somebody should be able, if you're going to a coach or any other service, our customers expect us to give them an estimate of the cost, the scope, and the duration that we think it'll take to get to whatever, once we've defined what the goal is. So if, if a coach can't say, you know, yeah, I think that's about a, a three months, let's give it three months and then see where we're at. But I think we could get roughly to here, right? I think you would be able to do the same with yeah, SEO. Absolutely. You know, I want to be on page one. Okay, well, that's, you can spend $10,000 a month and we might be able to get there in six months or, you know, well, I only have $500 a month. Okay, well, it's probably going to be six years, you know? Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> or, or there's other ways to do it. And you're, you, dude, and, and it, honestly, man, it's so funny how, you know, this, this val this information that you're sharing just for if anybody hasn't realized this is applicable to everything you do yeah. in life so yeah. if you're a, in general construction right and you provide kitchen remodels and somebody calls you up and says hey hey we need a kitchen how much yeah what do you mean like yeah do you want yeah. how many cabinets do you want or and then you got guys out there and listen it happens in the restoration industry digital marketing is the biggest predatory now, i don't want to say biggest i don't want to crap on anybody but there's a lot of opportunity to prey on people through the ambiguity of your services, right? So construction, marketing, um, yeah. you have to be yeah. super clear with what you're struggling with, what your goals are. Yeah. Um, if you're just, you know, trying to, you know, get healthier, that's like such a broad stroke yeah. of a brush. Yeah, yeah. What yeah. do you mean? Like you mental, physical, you know, yeah. you know what I don't understand. So yeah, that's a great, that's a great piece of advice. If you're looking for a business coach, know what you're wanting to get coached on. Yeah. Um, don't just call a, a remodel, a kitchen remodel company and say, I need a kitchen and then hang up the phone and then give yeah. them a, a one-star review because you got, you know, uh, one cabinet and a half a sink or something like that. Or you've yeah. got a kitchen in a, in a school for ants, like on a Zoolander, yeah. you know, you, you know, <laughs> yeah, what am I supposed to do with this? Is this a school for ants? Um, <laughs> no, that was, that was really good. Um, and it's true, you know, so a few things, if anybody's going to take anything away from this, um, be intentional. I'm not going to stop saying that, man, because that's such a, <laughs> it's, it's such a big part of our culture here and what I believe in in my personal yeah. life. Um, yep. You have to have intent with every step that you take. And you'll realize that your a lot of your failures you have or your, your a lot of failures are just perceived failures because you, yeah. you're never at that goal yet until you get to that goal. Right. Yep. So be intentional Learning. with what you do, whether you're trying to market your business, be intentional, have a why, have a what and try to understand what it yeah. is these people are going to be doing for you. And that's one of the big things we're trying to do with our book. And that's what your books are doing. And that's what your podcast is doing is, is, is helping people understand what that end game is and yeah. educating your, your customer or your potential customer or your contemporaries is a big part of trying to reset that mentality that you just mentioned yeah. to where, you know, have a goal in mind before you take that next step, because, um, you know, the, the keys are there. The answers are there. Uh, we're not reinventing the wheel. You're not yeah. reinventing the wheel. You're sharing your experience. Um, so I, man, I can't thank you enough for coming on. I think with that, we're hitting just about under an hour. We're going to go ahead and uh, close up shop for the day. 
we had some pretty funny comments. I can't wait to dive into those. And uh, I definitely want to have you on um, in the future. So how does somebody get in touch with you if they do want some coaching or maybe just wants to connect with you? Uh, the Diojo.com. Um, and uh, my email is IZ, IZ, the letter I and the letter Z at the Diojo.com. And, uh, and then the podcast is on YouTube, YouTube forward slash the Diojo, uh, Instagram, Facebook's got the TikToks, you know, so <laughs> you got to show me some TikTok dances, but listen, John, uh, thanks again, man. I want to have you on again. Um, anytime you want to come on be a guest, anything that you can think of that you can provide value to our four or five users. Um, one time we had 15 <laughs> downloads, so, you know, not bragging, but we did have 15 downloads on Spotify. Um, hey. you know, Love to have you on as a guest, man. We're going to continue to follow. Make sure you follow John at the Diojo, literally on every single social media channel. Check him out on YouTube, like he just mentioned, forward slash the Diojo. Um, he's co constantly contributing to RR Magazine. Um, you know, so he's he's very involved in the industry. So if you're looking for somebody to be a beacon of light of information, you got to check him out. And if you are a person with property damage needs in Washington State, you got to look up Eris Restoration. I heard those guys are pretty cool. Their logo is pretty dope too. Uh, John, thanks again, man. We will talk to you soon, bro. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I appreciate it. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep doing good things. And anybody out there that's considering something similar, just do it, you know? so Just do it. All right, buddy. Hey, listen, have a great weekend. We'll talk to you soon, man. Boom. Thanks, Ben. Yes, sir.